Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here at Stanford. I don't, don't always come, even though we're not so far away. Um, and thank you all also for staying until the last session of the day. Um, women and girls at the Center of Planetary Health Solutions, you're probably thinking this is the wrong crowd to be convinced of that. Um, however, I've been working ever since I remember work starting working on anything related to women's issues. And it is still important to find yourself in situations whereby you need, it's almost every year you need to reinvent yourself and the arguments that you need to put forward for a different uh, sort of a groups of stakeholders to bring them on board, specifically men, as Michelle has presented, to bring them on board to continue and understand the investments that um, every country needs uh, to the women and girls. So when I'm talking about the sake of planetary health, I'm thinking about particularly, I will focus on reproductive health and rights, including family planning, abortion, nutrition, and for food security, you can think about sustainable food productions, including poultry, aquaculture, and other animal and husbandry, as well as uh, fishing, firewood, and many forms of agriculture, but also forest conservation and sustainable water. So think of it as the key issues for planetary health. But one element that is the least talked about when we talk about planetary health are the threats that the planet has from rapid population growth. And because these are real and they are interconnected with all of issues related to the planet, I'm gonna focus more on the rapid uh, population growth and a little bit more and um, talk about it because women and girls are the center of the one of the solutions um, to get there. So we know that this is the data from today. The world population today is 7.7 .7 billion. But as you can see how fast it's growing, it took 200,000 years to reach the first billion and only 12 years to add the fifth and the sixth billion. So we're growing very, very rapidly. So if you look at, for example, what the UN projections for 2100 increases from 10.1 to 10.9 billion. And you see here the projections are uh, for low, medium, and high variant. And the differences between, for example, the low variant, which is 8.3 billion, to a medium variant of 10.9 billion is actually fewer than uh, one child on average per woman. So it is important to have that into consideration. So in terms of the percentage increase we had in 1965 was registered the most rapid increase in global population. Um, and in absolute numbers, it was actually in 2015 with a population when the population reached 7.3 billion with an annual increase of 1% per year overall for the globe. Um, but in many countries, like the ones that you've seen in various discussions, the maps of Sub-Saharan Africa, they are still growing at about 3% a year. So what it means if you go at 3% a year is that your population size doubles in 23 years. So that is very concerning for the social context and the economics of the countries to develop. That is a big challenge. And the countries that have woken up to some of these issues of the threats of population growth um, in Sub-Saharan Africa more recently have done so because economists took this information, did lots of studies and demonstrated and told the ministers of finance and presidents, you are not going to develop as a country if you don't, because you cannot reach a demographic dividend without decreasing total fertility rate. And to do that, you have to focus on women and girls. So 
Um, just very quickly, some of the threats that we all understand that are posed by rapid population growth. It exacerbates challenges to the biosphere. Irreparable damage to the biosphere also uh, can be seen. Climate change, loss of biodiversity, overfishing, multiple types of pollution, and also increases the inequities that continue to divide the social and economic sort of uh, spheres of the population. So the other thing is that population growth affects the age structure um, of in each country, and can, that can facilitate a factor for conflict and warfare, especially in poor countries where opportunities for education and jobs are really uh, lacking for young people. So um, if you look at this map of uh, fertility levels, which is just the average number of children a woman would have um, at the end of the, uh, the reproductive life, um, you see that if you overlap this map with other ones that you've seen today related to maternal mortality in earlier sessions, you're going to see that it still overlaps with a lot of what's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. If you talk about violence, if you talk about food insecurity, it overlaps with this map. So there is a link between um, that and all of the other issues that we see in the planet. And one of the things that can potentially um, decrease the fertility or the average number of children that women have is contraception. But as you can see for this graph, the trends overall show significant improvements everywhere in the world, including in Africa. Um, but you can see the difference of Africa still lagging behind. And it is in Sub-Saharan Africa where most of the population growth will come from uh, by 2050. So what I would like to share with you is what I call the family planning flower, because I'm not very good with the graphics, so the flower is kind of easy to show. But you can see how family planning or access to um, contraception and contraception information also that can be provided within a human rights framework is a simple cost-effective solution that can have tremendous implications to end hunger and poverty to increase education because young girls would stay longer in school, to empower women just in general because there's no more important, at least in my view, more significant empowerment, women empowerment, than the one that you have the ability to control your own body and decide how many and when to have your children. Um, it also improves uh, infant mortality, um, and just by sheer volume of the spacing, spacing deliveries would also help decrease child mortality. It improves maternal health. Um, a lot of it you, you've uh, heard this, um, this afternoon also. It decreases HIV and AIDS because a lot of women that are affected in Sub-Saharan Africa with HIV and AIDS also have an unmet need for family planning, so they need contraception themselves. It helps to address issues related to environment, even in a small community, things related to better agriculture or conservation. Um, small things that make a difference in the environment are still very significant and can have ripple effects um, at the country level. How do you use the forest or how do you cut deforestation? So you're going to need women and girls to participate in those discussions. Um, so for all of these different sort of round circles of this invented flower, you, we can spend a whole afternoon talk about uh, in, in a lecture, but I want us to move a little faster so to have some time for for discussion and um, a little bit more questions and answers, including for Michelle, because it's a really interesting talk and sort of I related a little bit with what I'm talking about. But the, the, the point that I wanted to make is that children should be by choice and not by chance. And it is um, an individual decision, yes, and somebody in the previous section um, discussion mentioned um, 
is it by bringing family planning to some of the communities outside of the US? Is it um, imposing some of our own Western values? But remember that a lot of women that are having six, seven, and eight children, according to the demographic and health surveys, they actually want fewer families. So a country like Angola, where I was born, where it's one of the four countries with the highest fertility in the world, where it still is over six on average, women state very clearly that they wanna have four. And I guarantee you that when the government puts significant efforts to allow women to have the number of children that they want, which is four, they're gonna want to have three. And then they're gonna, when they get to three, the next generation is going to have even fewer than three. So it's not imposing values, it's giving women, it's empowering them with options, and options that control their own fertility that actually have significant effects in the household, in their own lives, in their own household, in their own communities, and in the globe by just having the number of children that they want. A lot of people also ask, why do you need family planning in countries like Niger, where on average women to ha want to have six children. Well, to get to the six children where all of them are alive and the woman is also alive and in good health to continue to work for the six children, you still need family planning. You need to space the children. And at some point, when you get to six, you need to stop, especially in countries sub in sub-Saharan Africa, and in this case in Niger, where women start on average to have children at 15, 16, and 17. So if you have a child every year, you reach six very soon. So what happens after that? So very, very important. So I do think that investing in women and girls in different areas, but not forgetting the education, I'm talking about in this case formal education, empowering in them to make decisions, and most importantly, giving them full access, realistic access to sexual and reproductive health information and services, not the access that the IUDs are there, like I've seen in, um, uh, in countries in West Africa, and there were implants, but the implant costs $2.5. So how do you think that um, a woman that sells in the market is going to have maybe that day uh, two and a half dollars just to invest in um, a, uh, an implant that day. She might not have that kind of money. So that's what I'm talking about, the realistic access to those types of services. Um, I think that women are the world's best bet in the fight for a sustainable planet and empowering and investing in them will also help safeguard the, panel, the, the, the planet. So all of what I'm discussing here, you've seen um, also, they're all linked with sustainable development goals. But when you look at the sustainable development goal, the goal is to achieve you know, uh, zero hunger, but it doesn't say how exactly. And it doesn't put sort of a, the, it doesn't operationalize, you know, there we have indicators, but how do you get there? How you, we can measure things, but if you don't get to the measure, like many of the um, Millennium Development Goals from 2000 to 2015 that were not achieved, how do you, what and how do we do it differently um, to get to those goals? So it is important to put women and girls at the center of planetary health solution agenda and prioritize this sexual reproductive health. And this way we can mitigate the threats of rapid population growth and that that address also the planetary health solutions. And with that, it's not just at the individual level, it is important to do have, and I thank you, Michelle, for that very great lecture on the importance of having women in leadership positions. Thank you very much.